well, we are finally going to get through this chapter, which is Isaiah chapter 14. We've, we've been here for the last couple of weeks, uh, and we've never really gone through the whole thing verse by verse. So we're going to do that here tonight, Isaiah chapter 14. It's kind of a long chapter. And if you would permit me, here's what I would like to do tonight. I am going to kind of speed through the, the whole chapter, the 32 verses, uh, and then I'm going to backtrack and come back to Lucifer again. I want to just hammer Lucifer every time I can uh, when I'm here in this pulpit. Uh, because the devil is being worshipped today like never before. Satanism is on the rise and uh, witchcraft, the occult, is just exploding across uh, the world and across our nation. And so we have to educate the church to understand the dangers uh, of, uh, of this Satanism that is imminently coming upon our uh, our nation and upon the world. We know that eventually the whole world is going to worship Satan. That's what this is all leading to, the Antichrist, the one world government, the one world leader uh, who's going to demand to be worshipped and praised as God, who's going to demand that the people all take a mark on the right hand of their forehead. Uh, and if they will not take the mark and worship the beast and identify with the beast through this mark, they will be initially locked out of society. They'll be turned off uh, economically. They won't be able to participate by or sell. Uh, eventually, they'll be rounded up, and then they will be beheaded uh, during the Great Tribulation period. That's what the Bible tells us is coming for the world. So we would expect that the church would be getting weaker and weaker and that uh, Lucifer and Satan would be getting stronger and stronger as we see the day approaching of the Tribulation period when Satan himself is going to possess a man and is going to be worshipped as God uh, during the great tribulation period. And so uh, I want to go through the chapter and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the victory that we have over the devil through our faith and through Jesus Christ and his blood. It's very, very important. Uh, a lot of people are, are practicing witchcraft. A lot of people are into the occult. They're practicing astrology. And all kinds of other things. They're taking ayahuasca uh, and, uh, you know, hallucinogenics are, are exploding all over the country and all over the world. They're having these spiritual experiences where these spirits are coming to them and telling them information and things like this. Uh, and it's like we're opening Pandora's box. I mean, really, uh, people are just going to be flooded with demonic activity as they turn away from God and they start to go after uh, demons, and they start to worship other gods, or they worship Satan himself. It's just going to bring disaster upon our nation. It's going to bring disaster upon our world. But the Bible tells us in advance that that's what's going to happen, and we see really the handwriting on the wall for that uh, even now. So we have really spent a lot of time in Isaiah uh, drilling down on these texts up to this point and looking at all of the history, an exorbitant amount of history we've covered here in the first uh, 13 chapters of Isaiah. So that's why I feel like we don't need to really spend a lot of time on some of this. Some of this we've already covered here uh, uh, in Isaiah chapter 14. So let's pick up here in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 14. He's going to talk about the judgment against Babylon, against Assyria, and then uh, Philistia, or the Philistines here in this chapter. So Isaiah chapter 14, verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will still choose Israel and settle them in their own land. The strangers will be joined with them and they will cling to the house of Jacob. Then people will take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel will possess them for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. And they will take them captive whose captives they were and rule over their oppressors. So here the Lord is talking about his mercy that he is going to have on Jacob. Jacob is another name for Israel, and God certainly has been very faithful to Israel, to the Jews, and very merciful to them. He's brought them back into their land and fulfilled the prophecy, the dry bones prophecy of Ezekiel chapter 37. They're back in their land as God predicted they would be back in their land in the last days. They're back in the land in unbelief, so they would be restored physically as a nation first, and then they will be restored spiritually uh, to God after uh, uh, 
they're back in the land, and then, and then Jesus Christ returns at the end of the tribulation to save them from the Antichrist, and then all of Israel uh, will be saved in fulfillment of the prophecy in Romans chapter 11. But God is always so patient with his people. He says, I'm going to have mercy on Jacob. I'm going to still choose Israel because they're his chosen people, and I'm going to settle them in their own land. Uh, God is so merciful to his people. In the Old Testament, uh, he was merciful to Israel and didn't give them what they deserved, often would overlook their transgressions, their idolatry, their idol worship, and so forth. He was so patient with them. In the New Testament, he shows us great patience and great mercy. Uh, mercy is not getting the judgment that we deserve. So God gives us mercy in that he doesn't just wipe us out because we're sinners and that's what we deserve. Uh, and he gives us grace in that it's, you know, God's riches uh, at Christ's expense grace that he gives us his blessings that we do not deserve so we don't get the judgment and the wrath that we do deserve and then we get the blessings and the grace that we don't deserve as God's people it's such a wonderful thing uh, to be the children of God and to be his people uh, the prophecy here is for the last days actually this is not speaking about the Jews uh, being back in their land um, prior to the tribulation period this is actually when they're back in their land after the tribulation period because we're told here that they are going to possess the people, the nations, the Gentile nations for servants and maids in the land of the Lord. They will take them captive, whose captives they were, and they will rule over their oppressors. That has not happened yet. Israel is back in the land, as I said, in unbelief. They're back in the land, and they're not believing yet on Jesus Christ. They will one day believe on Jesus, I believe one day soon. There are many Jews believing on Jesus Christ, a great revival in Israel, greatest revival in Israel's history uh, of, of Christianity and people coming to faith in Jesus Christ there, and really all over the Arab world and all over the world, uh, especially a lot of the closed countries, Muslim countries and so forth. Great revival taking place of, of Jews, of Arabs, of Muslims coming to Christ right now all over the world. But this prophecy is later. This prophecy is, is when they're going to be back in their land and that they are going to be ruling over those who were their oppressors. And so most Bible scholars believe that this is speaking of verses 1 and 2, um, the time of the millennial reign of Messiah or the millennial reign of Christ when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning over Israel uh, for 1,000 years. And then that, this prophecy will be completed and fulfilled, verses 1 and 2. Verse 3 continues. Now he's going to pivot and turn to the king of Babylon and pronounce judgment upon the king of Babylon. It shall come to pass in the day the Lord gives you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and the hard bondage in which you were made to serve that you will take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say... How the oppressor has ceased and the golden city has ceased. Now we know that physical Babylon uh, is being spoken of here. Physical Babylon. They were the nation that would come against Judah, would besiege Judah, ultimately would uh, conquer Judah and ca carry Judah away into captivity uh, in Babylon for 70 years. We've studied this uh, in this in this series. Um, so that Babylon was judged in 539 B.C. by Cyrus, who was a king and a general uh, of the Medo-Persian Empire. Darius and Cyrus were co-regents, most scholars believe, uh, at the time of, of Daniel, when Daniel was an old man. Um, the handwriting on the wall, the finger on the wall, many, many take you farsen. And then uh, God uh, judged Babylon as he predicted that he would. Now this prophecy here in uh, Isaiah 14 was probably written somewhere around 715 BC. So uh, what happened, because we know that it was in the, the year that King Uzziah died in verse 28 of Isaiah 14. This is the burden which came in the year that King, I'm sorry, King Ahaz died. Uh, and so 715-ish BC is when the prophecy was given. Babylon fell in approximately 539 B.C. or 538 B.C. when the Medo-Persians conquered Babylon, as we looked at a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning here. Incredible military defeat as they uh, diverted the Euphrates River and then went in underneath the walls, underneath the gates of, of the river when they dried up the riverbed. Now, there is also a future Babylon, a spiritual Babylon in the book of Revelation that is also being judged here. 
And that Babylon is the revived Babylonian empire. Uh, whether it's a physical empire or not, we know it's going to be an economic empire, the uh, economic Babylon in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. Also a spiritual harlot or whore of Babylon, uh, which is a false church. It's a counterfeit to the true church. Satan's going to have his you know, false prophet. He's going to have his uh, you know, antichrist. And so you have the false uh, counterfeit trinity with the antichrist, the false prophet, and the dragon or the devil. Um, he's going to have a false... Um, uh, being killed and resurrected. He's going to appear to be killed, and then he's going to come back from the dead, so it's a counterfeit resurrection. And then he's going to have a counterfeit church. Jesus has a church who is his people, who is the bride of Christ. Uh, Satan is going to have his church, as it were, or his people, and they're called a harlot. They're called a whore of Babylon. And this will also, this harlot will be judged uh, by God, and that is going to happen Uh, when Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation period. So also, we can look at this prophecy here about Babylon, not just a physical Babylon being judged in 539 B.C., but the future judgment of the the harlot, the whore of Babylon, the harlot of Babylon, an economic Babylon in the book of Revelation. And then, of course, also we see that this is about the king of Babylon, and we know, as we're going to see here, that God gives Isaiah insight into into the person and the character Uh, uh, and the history of Lucifer or Satan. And so we know that Satan was then the power, the spiritual power that was influencing uh, Babylon because there were often uh, spirits that were behind the rulers. Oftentimes in the ancient world, the ancient rulers thought that they were gods. I mean, all you have to do is study the pharaohs of Egypt and see that the pharaohs believed they were divine beings. They thought they were God. And so people would worship them as gods. Uh, they would be treated as gods. They weren't mortal men. Uh, we know that the Greeks uh, had their mythologies of the god men and the half gods, the demi gods, and so forth. The Romans also had this. Uh, and the Romans actually believed that their emperors were gods. Julius Caesar, the first emperor of Rome, of the Roman Empire, declared that he was divine, that he was deity, and that he wasn't just a man, uh, and that you would worship him as, as well. This is why uh, in the early church, Many Christians were persecuted because they would not say um, Caesar is Lord or they would not say hail Caesar uh, because it was against their faith. We can't worship any other gods. So they would often arrest Christians uh, in uh, the later part of the first century A.D. and they would throw them into the uh, uh, coliseums with the lions and have the lions eat them and so forth because they refused to bow a knee before Caesar because they believed that Caesar was God. They believed the emperor was God of, of the Roman Caesars. And of course, uh, the Christians and the Jews would not ever worship a man as God. But it's, it's a common thing. So if you have a man who's in leadership, who's tremendously wicked and tremendously powerful, then you have an evil spirit behind that man or that woman. It could be a queen as well, like Jezebel. And, uh, and so we know that this is not merely speaking of the physical king of Babylon who would have been um, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, but it's speaking of the spiritual power behind the king of Babylon. Remember, the prince of Persia was hindering the angel in Daniel chapter 10. This demon was holding back this angel from responding to Daniel to give Daniel an answer to his prayer. Michael, the other archangel, had to come and take up the fight for him so that Gabriel could come and deliver the message. So the prince of Persia was a demon behind the king of the Persians. So um, many of you know that Hitler, who was one of the wickedest men who ever lived, obviously, Hitler was full-blown into the occult. A lot of historians don't talk about this, but if you research this, you'll find that Hitler brought in hundreds of Tibetan monks from Tibet, uh, Buddhist monks, He got the swastika symbol from Buddhism. Actually, the swastika is an ancient Buddhist symbol. And he took that because he had all of his monks, it was very secret at the time, practicing all kinds of dark magic and spells and curses and things like this with all of his top SS people. They had a whole base where they would go and they had all of these Tibetan monks who were there advising Hitler uh, and, and so forth. And it's interesting that Hitler believed in reincarnation. So he thought that if he killed people, he was doing them a favor. You know, you're, 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 you know, you're not a Nazi, you're not blonde haired and blue eyed, or you're, you are a Jew or whatever he said, you know, you're not the, the stereotype of who we think should build the, you know, the empire, 
uh, the, the, the Third Reich and so forth. And so he just killed them. But he thought he was doing them a favor. Why? Because Buddhism teaches in reincarnation. It teaches that death is not the end. And you're really helping people if you kill them and they're in the wrong body in this world. Maybe the next life they'll come out with blonde hair and blue eyes and they'll be an Aryan. He really believed this. The roots of this was Buddhism. Uh, and so there was certainly a very powerful demon, probably Satan himself, who was empowering Hitler to do what he did. We continue here in verse 5. He says, The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers. He who struck the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and no one hinders. The whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into singing. Indeed, the cypress trees rejoice over you and the cedars of Lebanon saying, since you were cut down, no woodsman has come up against us. So again, this is likely speaking of the prophecy in the last days when Babylon is being judged, the, the, this, the horror of Babylon and the economic Babylon, which is referred to in um, Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18. This would be after the tribulation period. Uh, verse 9 then says, Hell or Sheol or the place of the dead from beneath you is excited about you. To meet you at your coming, it stirs up the dead for you, all the chief ones of the earth. It is raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations. They all shall speak and say to you, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Your pomp is brought down to Sheol and the sound of your stringed instruments. The maggot is spread under you and worms cover you. Now, many Bible scholars believe, including uh, Pastor Chuck Smith from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, he taught that this was speaking of the Antichrist. So verses 5 through 8 are speaking of the Babylon that's going to be judged at the end of the tribulation period. Uh, verses 9 through 11 is speaking of that man of sin, that son of perdition, who is the counterfeit Christ, who is possessed by the devil himself and then is killed and is killed killed by Jesus Christ when Jesus returns at the end of the book of Revelation, and then he's cast into hell. He's cast into Gehenna, the lake of fire forever and ever, the Antichrist, who is also called the beast, and the false prophet. And so this is the scene when he is thrown into hell or into the lake of fire with all of those people that have gone before him, and they're going to say, like hell, uh, the, the place of the dead is going to be excited about you coming to meet you. All the chief ones, all those who had raised up their thrones, all the kings of the nations uh, that were influenced by this man, uh, the Antichrist, are going to ask him, you know, you were so powerful. Have you become as weak as we? Have you become like us? And indeed he will. He's, his end, the, the end of the Antichrist, is going to be hell forever and ever, the lake of fire. Now we continue here where we begin to look at the end of Lucifer. So you have the Antichrist, you have the false prophet, and you have the devil or the dragon. So here's the fall of Lucifer in verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nation. So obviously, uh, verses 9 through 11 could also be talking about Lucifer. Uh, because Lucifer was the power behind the Antichrist. But this is literally the devil himself. How you've fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like most, the most high so this is the five I wills of Lucifer, of him challenging God and challenging the throne of God and challenging the rule of God when he fell in rebellion against God and took a third of the angels with him. But here's his end, verse 15. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. Again, Sheol is the place of the dead. To the lowest depths of the pit. And those who see you will gaze at you and consider you sane. 
Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nation, all of them sleep in glory, every one in his own house, but you are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch, like the garment of those who were slain, thrust through with a sword, who go down to the stones of the pit, like a corpse trodden underfoot. You will not be joined with them in burial because you have destroyed your land and slain your people. The brood of evildoers shall never be named. Prepare slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers, lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the world with cities. And so this is a prophecy of judgment against Lucifer, the end of Lucifer, the one who uh, wanted to be like God, the one who wanted to be worshipped as God, the one who will ultimately take over this world and d- demand that everybody must worship him during the tribulation period. His end is in, in hell, the lake of fire. And the question is, all of these kings and all of these people are going to say, is this the man, is this the one who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms of the world, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Uh, he's going to be just cast down into hell, just like every other wicked individual that's ever lived. Uh, he's no one special. He's not going to have any special place for all eternity. He's going to have a, a very hot place in the lake of fire for all eternity. And this is the end of Satan, the end of Lucifer, and the end of his followers. All of those who follow Lucifer will follow him all the way to his end, which is hell and the lake of fire. Just like everyone who follows Jesus Christ will follow Jesus to his end, which is in heaven. So it's just a very simple choice. If you follow Lucifer, he'll promise you the world. In the end, you're going to get hell for all eternity. Uh, Jesus promises you life. He promises you life now and eternal life. Uh, And you will be with Jesus forever in heaven when you finish this life if you are trusting in Jesus Christ. So the choice is always ours. Now he continues here in verse 22 about the destruction of Babylon. He says, For I will rise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and the remnant and offspring and posterity, says the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the porcupine and marshes of muddy water. I will sweep it with a broom of destruction, says the Lord of hosts. Most Bible scholars believe, again, this is speaking of the Babylon of the book of Revelation that will be judged in the last days, where Babylon will will never be rebuilt. It will never be lived in again. It will be completely destroyed. It'll just be overrun by porcupines and marshes of muddy water when God judges Babylon uh, in the last days. Now, he begins to talk about the judgment against Assyria. Now, remember that Assyria at this time, 715-ish B.C., uh, had just carried away captive the 10 northern tribes of Israel. That was around 722 B.C. And so as, um, as Isaiah is writing this and God is giving him this prophecy, um, Babylon isn't even really a powerful nation at all yet. Assyria is the dominant world power. The Assyrians have already come against the ten northern tribes, conquered their, them and carried them away. And then the Assyrians were coming to besiege Jerusalem also. Uh, and we looked at that. We looked at that under King Hezekiah when Isaiah um, uh, was the prophet to King Hezekiah and God uh, sent an angel And the angel came and killed 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers in one night. And and so God is now talking about Assyria being judged. It was future from the time of Isaiah, uh, but it is past for us. He says this in verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out and who will turn it back? And so God predicted that he was going to break the Assyrians in his land. He says, in my land, verse 25, and on my mountains, God says, I will tread him under 
foot. And that's exactly what happened when they were uh, encamped there on uh, Scopus, the mountain Scopus, which is right there on the eastern part of Jerusalem, just up from the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. This is where the Assyrians were encamped and they were going to go in and they were going to destroy uh, Jerusalem. And then God destroyed them and defended his people, Judah. That happened, uh, uh, well, actually, the Babylonians destroyed the Assyrians and conquered their nation. God did this and defended his people uh, and, and protected them when Hezekiah was the king over Judah. But later, God completely wiped out Assyria, actually through the Babylonians. The Babylonians conquered Nineveh in 606 B.C., and Nebuchadnezzar, who was the general that went on to become the king of Babylon, was the one who destroyed the Babylonian Empire and destroyed, finally, once and for all, Nineveh, which was their capital city. Now, he continues and speaks here about Philistia, or the Philistines. He says this in verse 28. Now, this is the burden which came in the year that King Ahaz died. And again, most Bible scholars will say King Ahaz died somewhere around 715 B.C., so it gives us a date of this prophecy. He says, Do not rejoice, all you of Philistia, because the rod that has struck you is broken. For out of the serpent's roots will come forth a viper, and its offspring will be a fiery flying serpent. The firstborn of the poor will feed, and the needy will lie down in safety. I will kill your roots with famine. I will slay your remnant. Wail, O gate, Cry, O city, all you of Philistia are dissolved, for smoke will come from the north, and no one will be alone in his appointed times. Verse 32, what will they answer the messengers of the nation? That the Lord has founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall take refuge in it. Philistia was the perpetual enemy of the Jews, almost from the very first time they came into the promised land they had problems with the philistines uh they did not completely obey god's charge joshua when they came into the promised land god said wherever you set your foot it will be your land he gave the land to them but they had to go and conquer it and appropriate the land for themselves the promised land that god gave to god's chosen people and they eventually got tired of fighting so they stopped fighting their enemies they just started making peace treaties with their enemies and those enemies later rose up to give them a lot of uh, hell, quite frankly. I mean, really made their lives a living hell because they didn't obey God and drive these pagan nations out of the land. The nations began to harass them, especially the Philistines. You remember Goliath and his brothers, the giants, uh, uh, gave David trouble and King Saul trouble. And it was just n always problems with the Philistines. The Philistines were always uh, a, a problem for the Jews throughout their whole history that they were there in the land. And God says that he is going to judge them. And again, uh, God did judge the Philistines, and the Philistines don't exist anymore. It's interesting that the uh, emperor of Rome in 132 AD, Hadrian, the emperor, he was so mad at the Jews because the Jews kept rebelling against him and trying to overthrow the Roman Empire that he uh, killed a bunch of them, he drove them out of the land, and they were dispersed to the whole world. And he changed the name of Israel to Philistina or Palestine, and now it's become, on maps, uh, Palestine, and they're called the Palestinians. That was from the Philistines. They weren't, uh, the Arab peoples that are there now, like in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, they're not Philistines. The Philistines were giant, light-skinned, white people, probably with blonde hair. They were more like Vikings, Scandinavians. Most uh, historians tell us they came from Europe on ships uh, in the ancient world there on the Mediterranean Sea, and they took over the area of Ashkelon and the Gaza Strip there on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, um, they are not Arab peoples. Uh, the Philistines don't exist anymore. God obliterated them. The Palestinians are not Philistines, but they claim to be Philistines so that they could say, we've been in this land before the Jews were here. That's the whole reason they claim to be Philistines. Uh, but they're not Philistines. The Palestinians are Arabs, of course. Now, in chapter 15, we're going to get into the proclamation against Moab, and it goes on for several chapters here uh, where, where God is pronouncing judgment upon all of these nations that gave all kinds of trouble uh, to Israel, which eventually God did uh, judge all these nations that gave so much trouble to his people Israel. So, let's turn back to verse 12, or we could just end the sermon right here and we're done for the night, so... <laughs> Get out of here really early tonight if you want. 
but that wasn't the plan. I want to dig down a little bit more into uh, the fall of Lucifer. And I have entitled this message, uh, The Gates of Hell Will Never Prevail. The Gates of Hell Will Never Prevail is the title of this message. So again, back to Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God or over all of the other angels. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. In other words, I will be like God. I will be God is what he was saying. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be worshipped as God. Verse 15 says, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. And so we know his end. We know how he fell. We're told here how he fell. Uh, It was because of his pride. Uh, We're told that he was beautiful. He was the most beautiful of all the angels. He was likely the worship leader in heaven uh, prior to the uh, fall of the one-third of the angelic realm. And he was coveting uh, God's throne. He was jealous. He was coveting God's throne. He wanted to be God. He wanted to be worshipped as God. Uh, But, of course, he's not God. He's a created being. He's one who was created uh, by God. He is not God. He could never become God. He is a created angel, a fallen created angel. Now, Jesus tells us, in the New Testament, and this is to the child of God. This is for the Christian. These are, these are some of the promises that we have to the church uh, in that we are victorious over the devil himself, regardless of the demons. We have victory over the spiritual forces of darkness, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because the Holy Spirit who lives in us is greater than all the demonic realm. And so if you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit living within you, and therefore the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Jesus said it, and that's exactly what we see throughout church history. We read in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 17, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, speaking of Simon Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, shall never prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And so uh, Jesus is here. It's the first time actually the word church is ever mentioned in the Bible. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my church And the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And against all odds, after 2,000 years, looking back at church history, as messed up as the church has been for 2,000 years, the church is still alive and well on planet Earth. We're evidence of that here in our church. Uh, All over the world, the church is is flourishing, although there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, heresy and hypocrisy and blasphemy and all kinds of things that are taking place in a lot of the churches. Uh, just dead religion and dead religious tradition and so forth throughout the old churches of Europe. But the church is alive and well on planet Earth and God has his people and he has his remnant all over the earth as Jesus predicted, as Jesus promised. The gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Now when he says, uh, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church, he wasn't saying he's going to build the church on Peter uh, or the popes. That's not at all what he was saying. The rock is what Peter said about him. Where Peter said in verse 16, Jesus was saying, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you got it, Peter. You didn't figure that out on your own. My father showed this to you. And upon this rock, that statement that Peter just made, that I am the Messiah and I am the son of the living God, upon that truth, that foundation, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It has nothing to do with Peter or the popes. It's not at all what was intended by Jesus in this. That is a twisting and a perverting of what this scripture really means in its clear context. The rock is not Peter. Peter was certainly not a rock. He was something else, but he wasn't a rock for for the Lord. As a matter of fact, Jesus told him, "Get get thee behind me, Satan, in verse 23, 
You are an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to Peter, the one who he just applauded and commended for saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is commending him for that, saying, My Father has shown this to you, and upon this rock... I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. But then he rebukes him and calls him Satan uh, because Peter began to rebuke him and say, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. When Jesus was telling them that he was going to suffer, that he was going to be killed and that he was going to be raised on the third day. Peter didn't like that plan. Peter wanted Jesus to rule and reign now so he would be his right hand man. And Jesus looks at the power behind what Peter was saying. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So we know that the rock is not Peter when Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. It's evident. Ro Peter was not a rock. Uh, certainly, he went on to become a pillar in the early church, but he's the one that went on later to deny that he even knew Jesus. You remember the three times before the rooster crowed that morning, he denied even knowing the Lord. So thank God the rock is not Peter or the Pope. Uh, matter of fact, the Pope uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago decided that God's okay with gay marriage now. Did you know that? Our current pope, who's actually a Marxist, uh, and uh, he has uh, diminished the fight against abortion. The Catholic Church has always been on the front lines in fighting against abortion for the, the right to life and so forth. He uh, refused to support even political candidates in our country that are against abortion. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was silent on the issue of the uh, politics that we just went through. And now he's saying that he believes that civil unions of homosexuals are okay with God and that homosexuality should be allowed in the Catholic Church and that uh, civil unions, if they come in with their kids, they should be treated just like everybody else. Well, thank God that this Pope Francis is not the rock that the church was built upon because otherwise the gates of hell would prevail against the church, uh, bringing homosexuality into the, into the church, which is an abomination to God, that lifestyle, as you know. That's what the scriptures say. So uh, the Pope is not uh, infallible. The Pope is not perfect. The Pope cannot absolve anyone of their sins. These are not true teachings uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, which I was raised as a Roman Catholic for 18 years. I was in private education, private school for most of that time. I was an altar boy in the church. Uh, you know, I was, a, I was a devoted, diehard Catholic. So I'm not slamming Catholicism. I'm just saying the Pope is not uh, the rock that Jesus Christ has built his church upon. Otherwise, the church wouldn't uh, prevail over the gates of hell. So he continues uh, here as he's saying, the get gates of hell will not prevail against my church. You know, people think that the gates of hell is somehow talking about the satanic powers of darkness or it's talking about demons, you know, and, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against my church. But it's actually the opposite. Gates don't attack you. You attack gates, right? You kick gates in. If you're a conquering king and you're trying to conquer another kingdom, you storm the gates. You, you take a battering ram, you, you bash the gates in. You storm the gates. And the gates, he says, of, of the devil, the gates of hell, where people are entrapped by the devil and they are in bondage to sin and to Satan, Jesus says, those gates will not prevail against my church. In other words, my church is going to blow the gates of hell right open. And I'm going to go in there and I'm going to take my people from those places that were worshiping the devil. You know, and think about it. In the, in, in the ancient world, everybody worshiped the devil. I mean, nobody really knew the Lord, the God of the Bible, except for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jews. Uh, and they even went after other gods for a long time. Uh, and then the Christians, God's people, the Christians. So when Christianity started... The whole world was worshiping the devil in one form or another, but everywhere that missionaries were sent all over the world, whether it was cannibals in Papua New Guinea or headhunters in Africa and the Congo or whether it was the uh, Druids and the Celts in ancient Europe, uh, everywhere the church went or even coming here to America or going to Central America, South America with the Aztecs and Montezuma and the Mayans and all of these other religions that were worshiping the gods and worshiping the stars, the gates of hell could not stop the church. The church conquered the world. I mean, really, everywhere the church went, light came to the whole world. And what's interesting now is that even the nations that were the first really uh, powerful bases for missionary work and for church planting and so forth, especially Europe and America, uh, they're turning away from the truth of Jesus Christ and they're going back to their ancient gods, 
that they used to worship before Christianity and the light of Jesus Christ came in to expose the darkness and to uh, uh, bring people into the truth. But the gates of hell will never prevail against my church, Jesus says. He is going to uh, storm the enemy's gates. He's going to kick in the gates of hell and storm the gates of hell. Uh, and they will not be able to stop him. So again, it's the power of Jesus Christ over the devil himself and over all of the demonic realm. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says this after he was resurrected from the dead and he had atoned for the sins of the world. We read this in Matthew 18, I'm sorry, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is the Great Commission. This is when Jesus was raised. This is where Jesus was about to ascend to go up into heaven. And he's telling his disciples, the 11 that were there with him in Galilee after Judas Iscariot had already hung himself and before Paul the Apostle was appointed and ordained to fill Judas' spot, uh, Jesus is telling them, at this point, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In heaven would mean the, the, the spiritual realm, that Jesus has power, all power over all the spiritual realm and over all physical realms. So Jesus says, and it's true, the gates of hell will not stop me. The gates of hell will not prevent my church or my body. And then he gives the great commission here after he declares that all authority has been given to him. Because remember, he's in us and we're in him. So if all authority has been given to him, it's been given to us as well. And so he says, go therefore, make disciples of all the nations. No notice that Jesus doesn't say go and make converts and get people to say the sinner's prayer. He says, make disciples of all the nations. A lot of people get saved by saying the sinner's prayer, but that's not what Jesus, that's not the great commission. It's not to go out and preach the gospel and just get decision cards written up that somebody made a decision for Christ. Because a lot of times those same people come every year back to the Billy Graham crusades and get saved every year, you know. Uh, matter of fact, Billy Graham told a story about he was on an airplane ride flying somewhere and some guy was drunk as a skunk. I mean, just drunk off of his uh, backside there on the airplane and recognized Billy Graham and was just went and sat next to him was drunk and stunk like alcohol and was saying Mr. Graham you saved me you saved me he goes well it must have been me because Jesus sure didn't save you <laughs> he told the guy so so it's it's not about making converts it's about making disciples of all the nations and disciples are those who will take up their cross and follow Jesus Jesus says, if anyone wishes to be my disciple, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross, crucifixion of our flesh, and let him follow me. So we're not called to go and, and, and make converts. We're called to make disciples, those who are completely surrendered to Christ. And then, of course, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in reference to uh, the Trinity. So all power given to me in heaven and on earth. In Philippians... In chapter 2, we also read this, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, we read this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on the earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so Jesus, who was God, he didn't lay aside his deity. He couldn't do that. He could never stop being God. But he took on, God took on a human body. He became man. He took on flesh, 
Uh, he had no sin nature. He was not born of a human father. He was born of a virgin, and he was born of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus laid aside his position of heaven. He laid aside his throne. He laid aside his powers. He laid aside uh, all of this to come here to the earth. He never ceased being God. He never stopped being God. That wouldn't be possible, but he became a man. God became a man and humbled himself even to the obedience of the point of death, even the horrible, terrible death of the cross. And because of the obedience of Jesus Christ, God the Father also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven. So this is talking about the angelic realm, which would include the demonic realm. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on heaven and on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's all creation. All the creation will one day bow the knee and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. But even now, the believer, the Christian, who has the Holy Spirit within us, we have that power over the demonic realm. Satan has no power over us anymore. We are God's people. And Jesus is victorious. We're in Christ. He is in, in us. We are his body. And we are his bride. In Colossians, in chapter 1, we read this about Jesus. Colossians is right after Philippians. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 says this. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This is the Bible talks over and over again about the blood of Jesus. We sang about it in that last song here tonight. The blood of Jesus. Blood may gross people out, but it was the blood of Jesus that was required to be shed for us. The blood is the life. His life had to be poured out in order for him to pay for our sins and to purchase us back to God as his people. And so he says that we, um, we are those who have been redeemed through his blood or purchased by his blood. We've had our sins forgiven, verse 14. He is the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn or the preeminent one over all creation. In other words, he was there before everything was created. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so in essence, Jesus who is God, Jesus who is the express image of the invisible God. Remember, God is invisible. God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God the Father is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. God took on a body. God the Son, Jesus, came. He took on a body. Uh, and so we got to know what God was like because we knew what Jesus was like. And Jesus would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He would say, I and my Father are one. We're told that Jesus in Hebrews 1 is the exact representation of his Father. And so he came. He is the express image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation, the preeminent one. He's been there from before everything was created. Uh, for by him, verse 16, all things were created that are in heaven. So he created everything. Jesus is not a created being. Lucifer, on the, on the other hand, is a created being. They're not equal. Lucifer is an angel. Jesus created Lucifer. He created all of the angels. We're told he created everything that's in heaven and on the earth whether it's visible or invisible things, whether it's thrones or dominions or principalities and powers. So he's talking here about the whole angelic realm, including the fallen angelic realm, which would be the demonic realm, powers and principalities, thrones, and so forth. And Jesus is over all of them. Why? He's the creator. He created all of them. And he is before all things. Verse 17, not only did he create everything in verse 16, He's existed for all time. In the Word, uh, uh, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was made flesh, and uh, the Word uh, became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word took on a human body and dwelt among us. But He has always existed. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He created everything, John 1 tells us. And so here He is. He's before all things, He's always existed. And in Him, all things consist. He holds the world together, He holds the invisible 
uh, nuclear level, the atomic level of the universe together. And if God wasn't holding the universe together, the universe would explode. You know, it's an amazing thing. When they separate the atoms and they get the atom for nuclear fu uh, fission and fusion and nuclear bombs and nuclear energy, they're just upsetting the natural order of the atom uh, with the protons and electrons, and they're, they're hitting these things with, with protons until they break them apart. And as soon as they break apart that atomic glue, they have this huge explosion that's a result. And, and the scientists really don't under, understand how the atoms are held together. It's kind of like uh, a contradiction. They don't really, really understand how atomic uh, fusion works. They know how to create atomic bombs and atomic energy, uh, but they don't know why the atoms themselves stick together like glue, which makes up everything that's material in the universe. And we know that uh, the invisible things were created, uh, even the atoms and the molecules and the protons and the neutrons and the electrons, all of them were created by God. And he's the one, Jesus is the one that holds everything together. By him, all things consist. So we know that Jesus has all power. Uh, Jesus surrendered to God. Even though he was, was God, he came to the flesh. He humbled himself, took on a human body, and died for the sins of the world. And then uh, we know here in Colossians that he created even the angelic realm. And they are uh, subservient and submitted to him. He is their creator. And one day he is going to judge the devil and his angels. In the book of 1 John, we're told this in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not God, is, is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is in the world. And so if John wrote this 2,000 years ago, that the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world back at that time, uh, we know that, that he's in the world today. He's been in the world since, since really the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, uh, the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist, trying to turn people away from Jesus Christ. And really, Satan has always wanted to be worshipped as God. And so he's saying, uh, don't believe every spirit. So there's spirits that you could possibly have contact with. And as people are, again, playing with Ouija boards, they're getting into the uh, astrology and astrological signs and charts, uh, and they're beginning to practice witchcraft. They're beginning to practice Reiki healing and yoga and all of these Middle Eastern uh, sort of belief systems for the purpose of enlightenment. They need to be very, very careful because you may end up opening a door to Pandora's box that you can't get, you can't get that, you know, whatever comes through that box door, you know, you open it up. You can't get the genie back in the bottle. You have to be very, very careful when you start to mess around with this. And then when people start to have contact through their meditation, through a spirit, a beautiful angel or a beautiful spirit comes to them and begins to speak to them and tell them things. You know, it's a very, very dangerous thing. You are not to believe every spirit. Remember that Satan even comes as an angel of light. He's a deceiver. He comes and deceives you. And he comes to appear as a good angel, an angel of light. Uh, but we are to be those who test the spirits to see whether they are of God because there are many false prophets that have got out uh, into the world. He continues here in verse 4, speaking about the Antichrist in verse 3. He says this, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And so he's telling us, uh, his people, his children, he's saying, you are of God to the Christian, to the church, little children. You have overcome them. Who's them? The false prophets that are going to go out into the world, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh, uh, the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and now is in the world. He's saying, you have overcome the devils, the demons, Satan himself and the whole demonic realm because Jesus has conquered and Jesus is victorious and all authority 
has been given to Jesus, and Jesus has given us as his people that same authority over the demonic realm. It's a very simple uh, but profound truth that Satan, the devil, is a defeated foe. Now, as people worship him and seek him, he gets more power in the world because people are welcoming the devil into their homes, into their lives. Uh, and they're worshiping the devil, so they're giving the devil a place. But for the child of God, the devil can't hurt you. He can't hurt me uh, because greater is he that is in me. It's not me. It's Jesus. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the Holy Spirit is the one that's greater than the devil that lives in me. Greater is he uh, who lives in you than he who lives in this world, speaking of the devil himself. So the devil is a defeated foe, and we are victorious over Satan and his uh, dominions uh, and, and his demons and all of these creatures that uh, fell with him, all of these demons that uh, uh, were taken when he rebelled. Uh, we have power over them. We have authority over them because Jesus conquered them on the cross and when he was raised after the third day. Now we read in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, a scene from heaven that says this, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, speaking of the devil, and the dragon and his angels, or the demons, fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony and that they did not love their lives even unto death. And so this is a future falling of Satan, where Satan will no longer have access to the throne of God. Right now, Satan apparently has access to the throne of God to accuse us. It says here that he accuses God's people, our brethren, before God day and night. He's the accuser. Remember, he was there with Job, accusing Job before God in the book of Job. Uh, he was accusing Joshua, the high priest, in the book of Zechariah. Uh, Peter said, uh, Peter, Peter, don't you know that Simon has, uh, don't you know that Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat? But I have prayed for you, and when you are restored, strengthen your brethren. And so even when Jesus was on the earth, he was telling Peter, Peter, you need to wake up. Peter, you need to be careful. Satan is, is asking for permission to destroy you. And we know that uh, eventually Satan did get to Peter because Peter denied the Lord. And then, of course, he repented and God restored him and saved him. Um, and, and we're told here that Satan is there now, accusing us before God. And we know that Jesus is there at the right hand of God, there to make intercession for us, to basically uh, defend us and say to God, even though probably what the devil is saying about you is true, what he's saying about me, the devil doesn't have to make stuff up. All he has to do is tell God what a rotten person we really are, you know, even if it's in our past. I mean, our past uh, is still part of who we are. Uh, and so Satan doesn't have to invent anything or lie about us. All he has to do is tell the truth about us to God and accuse us as being sinners because we are sinners. But then Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus in our, is our intercessor. Jesus is there at the right hand of the throne of God in order to make intercession for us and to tell uh, his father, Father, this one belongs to me. Yes, he's a sinner. Yes, he's fallen, but he belongs to me. I purchased him with my blood. And so we have an accuser and then we have and advocate that are there before the throne of God. But there's going to be a time, likely at the midway point of the tribulation period, that Satan is for once and forever cast out of heaven, cast down to the earth and all of his demons, and that's when uh, it's going to get really, really, really bad uh, for the people who are on the earth for that last three and a half year period of time, which is called the Great Tribulation Period. But that's going to usher in the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ have come. And, and, and it's going to be really close to Jesus coming to take his possession of the earth and to judge the devil once and for all. But verse 11 tells us how we have victory over the devil. 
Uh, They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even unto death. So we overcome the devil himself, not by any of our goodness or righteousness, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are protected by the blood of Jesus Christ. He really can't, Satan really can't touch us. Um, unless you let, unless you, you know, go after the devil and open the door to him, well, then he'll destroy you. Uh, but as long as you are in Christ, abiding in Christ, and you are surrendered and humble before God and seeking the Lord uh, and obedient to the Lord to the best you can, uh, the devil can't touch you. He really cannot harm you because of Christ in you, uh, the hope of glory. It's interesting that in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7, where it's talking about the two witnesses who are opposing the Antichrist for the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, and nobody can harm them, nobody can touch them. Uh, Basically, they call down fire from heaven. They pronounce prophecies of droughts and so forth. Uh, Plagues they bring upon the Antichrist and his kingdom. But we read in verse 7 of Revelation 11, when they finished their testimony, The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, or the Antichrist, will make war against them and overcome them and kill them. But then they're raised again. They're raised from the dead after uh, three and a half days in verse 11, and they're resurrected. Uh, But notice that it was when they were finished with their work, when they had finished their mission, when they finished their testimony. Satan couldn't touch them until they were done with their mission. And then... God allowed them to die, which is not the end. Death is not the end for the believer. Death is really just the beginning as we transition like the uh, caterpillar going into the uh, cocoon and dying so that it can come out and fly away as a butterfly. Uh, death for the Christian is like this. This body is not our eternal body. This body is not our, our permanent body. We're going to get a new body that's going to be like the body of Jesus Christ, the perfect, resurrected, sinless body of Jesus Christ. But the devil can't touch you until God is done with you. And when God is done with you, as, as is the case here, then, uh, then you get to go to be with Jesus, and so will I. And that's a far better thing than being stuck here in this rotten world, this fallen world. In the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 16, we read this. I want to read this to you quickly here. Romans 16 and verse 17 says this. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Warning about false prophets coming into the church, those who are, you know, causing divisions and offenses in the body. But he says this in verse 19, Romans 16, 19. For your obedience has become known to all, therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good, and simple or innocent concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so in contrast to those who are causing divisions, to those who are causing offenses, uh, those who are teaching contrary doctrines, uh, those who are not serving the Lord Jesus but have their own ambitions and have their own agendas, And through their smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. He's saying, don't be like that. He's saying, but be obedient. And he says this, for your obedience has become known to all, and uh, I want you to be wise in what is good. I want you to be innocent of of evil or ignorant of evil. Christians should not be enthralled with evil. We shouldn't be those who are mesmerized by the occult or mesmerized by sorcery or witchcraft. We're so super curious about that forbidden knowledge. Uh, You know, we we should be wise in what is good, which is the word of God, and we should be simple concerning evil. We should not uh, go after the unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5 tells us. uh, uh, and, And then when we do this, the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. So again, it's victory against the devil, the head of the demons, that Satan himself crushed underneath our feet. He says, as long as you're humble, you're obedient, you're walking in the truth, uh, and you are wise in what is good, and you are innocent of evil, then the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet shortly. So it's a promised victory over our enemies. Remember that Jesus told us we would have power over serpents and demons uh, uh, and devils in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. 
Jesus says, I'm giving you all this authority and don't rejoice that the devils uh, are subjected uh, to you or submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, and this is where we're going to end here. Ephesians chapter 6 gives us a list of our armor, the spiritual armor that we are to put on to protect ourselves from the attacks of the devil and of the demons. He says this in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, Paul the Apostle. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so Paul is saying, look, your human enemy is not really your enemy. It's the demon that's behind that human enemy that's giving you problems, whoever that human might be. Uh, he's saying it's not a, it's not a human, this is not a human battle. This is a spiritual battle. There is a spirit behind uh, many rulers and leaders and, and uh, people who are not Christians that will really give Christians a hard time and come after us and so forth. Even politically, you know, we just went through this really difficult uh, political season and all of this name calling and, 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 and slandering and st- so forth and all these lies in the media. But, you know, we have to understand uh, it's, it's the powers and principalities behind the rulers, behind the people, behind even the politicians, the evil politicians uh, that, that we really need to pray against. We need to pray for the salvation uh, of those who are our enemies. We need to pray for our enemies, Jesus said, and love our enemies uh, and do good uh, to those who spitefully use us. So he's saying uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So the battle is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle against powers and principalities. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God, verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all power and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So he's telling us there are defensive, there's defensive armor that we could put on to defend ourselves against the attack of the enemy. Uh, Girding our waist with truth. The truth would be the truth of God, which is the word of God. And Jesus is truth personified. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we gird our waist with truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. This means that we are righteous people. We're trying to live a righteous life. Uh, Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It means that everywhere you go, you're looking for opportunities uh, to share the gospel of peace with other people where you go. So you have a mindset of others rather than just yourself. Uh, you take the shield of faith which, with which you uh, will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And so to stop the attacks of the enemy, which are attacks in our mind, more often than physical attacks, the enemy attacks us in our mind, in our brains, in our thought life, uh, we take the shield of faith. And that is uh, the scripture, standing upon the scriptures by faith, standing upon the word of God, the promises of God, to quench the attacks of the enemy that come into our mind to attack uh, our, our minds and our thought life. And then he tells us uh, that you'll have the uh, helmet of salvation. So you're saved and your mind is protected by your salvation and the sword of the spirit. So those are all defensive. Uh, this is defensive armor. Now we get into the offensive weapons. So the offensive weapons are the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Remember that Jesus uh, rebuked the devil with the word of God when the devil came to tempt him in the wilderness in Luke chapter 4. Jesus just continued to quote scripture until the devil left him alone. And so uh, the word of God is our offensive weapon, the scriptures. Not just knowing the scriptures, but obeying the scriptures. That's where the power lies. Uh, The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So our prayer life is also an offensive spiritual weapon. Praying for people praying for your loved ones, praying for those who are lost in sin or in the occult or in a cult or into all sorts of other things. Pray for them, pray for them, pray for them because again, it's not a battle against flesh and blood. It's a battle against powers and principalities 
And prayer is an offensive weapon. God answers prayers. And Jesus tells us, keep seeking, keep asking, keep knocking. If you're praying for a loved one, don't ever stop praying for them because someday they may, they may get saved. You know, you are, you are continually petitioning heaven for this one's salvation. And let's believe by faith that God will answer the prayers that we pray for our loved ones. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the victory that we have in you, Jesus. We thank you that the gates of hell will never prevail against your church. We thank you that all authority in heaven and on earth has been granted unto you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, have conquered all dominions and thrones and powers and principalities, Lord, and you have trodden them under your feet. And so, Jesus, we ask for your strength in these last days where so many are going after devils and demons and witchcraft, Lord, and sorcery and, and drug use and opening all of these doors into the occult and to the demonic spiritual realm. May you give us the strength and the faith to stand, Lord, that we might be those who are your people, that remnant, Lord, who have a little bit of strength in the last day's church. Use us, Lord, we pray. Bless us, Lord. Bless your people. Continue to guard our hearts and minds, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.